What can't hear me? Am I on? You're working on it. Push the button. I am on. Am I on now? Okay. The Ascending Mount Morning Sound System is at the will of a precious child that got her tonsils out. So that's part of, part of what we're doing this morning. All right. First announcement. Peyton Cop has lost an important family member, her moose, Madeline. So Madeline is a doll moose, brown in color, that is somewhere in the church because I saw it in her hands when she came in. So if anybody has seen the moose, Peyton would love it. We know where it is? I hear a pssst, pssst. That's up there? Okay, good. All right. Very good. All right, our birthday announcements this week. Um, two on the same day. Uh, very interesting that that would happen. Miss Susan Starks and Miss Mindy Weirich on the 5th. So I look forward to celebrating that. And then Chloe, God bless her, is on the 9th. And she's still recovering from her procedures on Friday. But let's sing a happy birthday to, to these Three precious ladies. practice today, but I got a funny feeling that Miss Carol is still under the weather, and so we probably will not have a choir practice today. Okay. Feed my sheep on Wednesday, as far as we know. All right. Planning on it. Sign up sheep to deliver fruit bags to friends and family or neighbors by today. So this is the cutoff date for the fruit bags if you want to take them to your neighbors. And then next Sunday... After the Christmas program, we'll be having finger foods and light refreshments. So next Sunday evening, we have the play that the kids have been working on. We'll be having finger foods and light refreshments for those that would stick around. So we've asked that you would bring those types of things uh, to share with our neighbors and friends that, that come. Uh, reminder that our custodian position is now open due to a wedding. And uh, so we we're very excited about the wedding, very sad about the loss of the employee. But uh, we've had a few folks interested so far, but we certainly need anybody that really wants to do the work. So we're trusting in the Lord to lead us the next person. But if you know who that ought to be, go ahead and encourage them to go. And speaking of that wedding, if you plan to attend Casey and Martha's wedding, we, Nancy has asked that you would contact her by Friday so that they can be aware of the food um, preparation for that. And then a fun event coming up. Um, I've, I've come to be told that the Bland County Martha Stewart is Susan. Well, Martha Stewart's daughter, Karen, has, has carried forth that gene. And so she is having two open houses, but the one that's, that's important to us is in your bulletin on the 18th of December from two to six. It's a come and go kind of a deal, but at Karen and Eric Faulkner's home, uh, they will be celebrating in their new kitchen and uh, an opportunity to get together and, and have some good food, I'm sure, from her, but some fellowship as a church body, and she's opening her, house, her home up to everybody on that day. All right? All right. That's all I got. Let us pray, and then because of the play, we've cleared the platform, and uh, so the choir is going to come up, so give them just a moment to, to come up. And then, uh, and they will sing with us, and then uh, we will proceed throughout our worship. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, which is new every morning. We thank you for the beauty of this day, as cold and crisp as it may be. Uh, Father, you have given us breath and life. And so we come together once again to celebrate you, the Prince of Peace. As we gather and consider all that you did for us by coming, your advent here, your appearance on this earth, Father, humble our hearts once again to see what all you have provided for us through your salvation 
and through our obedience to you, your kingdom on earth. So we pray, Father, as we do in the Lord's Prayer, that your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth. This kingdom of peace, this kingdom of righteousness, may it fill us once again. So as we prepare our hearts to worship today, we ask that you indeed would guide us to that peace, that you would humble us to the place that we need to be in order to fully grasp our obedience to you and to walk in your will. We love you and we thank you for your grace that sustains us all through the cross, through the blood, and through the name of Jesus. Amen. Choir, come sing. As the choir comes to uh, sing, we'd like for each one of you to take your red hymnal and turn to page 258. We're going to go tell it on the mountain.
Can everyone please stand for the scripture reading? Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his lions. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall get graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand at the adder's den. And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of knowledge and the Lord, knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In the day that the root of Jesse, in the day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious.
second Sunday of Advent, peace. We read our responsive reading as we reflect on Jesus being the bringer of peace. Every year we light the candles as we prepare for the coming of Christ. More and more candles, more and more light. As we watch and we wait for Jesus, the light of the world. Receive God's promise of peace from Psalm 4. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when we call to him. Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. We will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make us well safe. Thank you, Lord. As we prepare for communion, the children are dismissed. Children's Church, and the elders may come forward. Peace in our hearts comes only because Jesus comes. Our lives are filled with chaos and turmoil. Our great enemy brings difficulty into our lives, and so today as we prepare our hearts and minds Return to the Prince of Peace, reflecting upon all that he has done for you, perhaps confessing your sins once again that hold you back from fully understanding, especially the sin of bitterness, the sin of guilt, that holds you back from fully participating with the Lord. Let us prepare our hearts as we prepare to take communion together.
And on that night, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. A reminder that sacrifice had to come for our peace. What was lost in the garden had to be restored. And that restoration required a physical sacrifice. Once for all, thankfully, ceremony can end. But this process that we go through week by week is a reminder of Christ infilling in us that is transformative. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for your son. And we pray again, accepting the reality of his lordship as well as our salvation. So we receive this gift today, a precious reminder of who you are. And we declare this is your son's body given for us. Amen. Take each of you and eat. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood spilt for you. His sacrifice, his cleansing. We need cleansing. We need it once at our salvation. We need it once for all, which was the final sacrifice. But daily, because we have to return to the cross. We need his cleansing. And so now we take this as a reminder that we need the forgiveness of our sins and we confess them to the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice, for the blood spilt, for the renewing in our lives, for the cleansing. And so we take this worthily now before you because we declare you as Lord. We love you. We thank you through your son, Jesus. Amen. Take each of you and drink. What you can't see up here is I'm contending with props, trying to move things around as we approach the play. It's good to be back with you again this morning. How is everyone? You okay? Yeah? Is the Prince of Peace showing up in your lives? Are you at peace? This is that season that can become quite chaotic, isn't it? I've heard it said and read about in other places that um, Christmas is not, can be not a fun time because of memories, because of the chaos, because of travel, because of so many things. And we lose focus on the reality. Can we return to peace? Can we be at peace? The Prince of Peace says, yes. And he came for that purpose. This morning as we continue the second week of Advent and we look forward in anticipation this announcement that Jesus is coming. The Messiah will arrive. We will look now as we walk backwards in the story at the presentation of his cousin John the Baptist. The declaration that he is the long-awaited Messiah. And so we return to the Gospel of Matthew, and now we turn backwards a few pages to chapter 3. And if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, and we will read the first 12 verses. And in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, A voice of one crying in the wilderness, 
Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, John. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But, you always got to pay attention to the but. When he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these very stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. We read in Isaiah that there is a new root from Nazareth, a root from David. But even now the axe is laid to the root of the existing trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mighty than, mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork, in fact, is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. I grew up in church. How about you? What's your journey, your story? Every time the doors were open, every ceremony, every opportunity I went, I was recounting to Jim Starks and he shared a similar story. Not only did I always come to church, but I grieved with those that grieved, even though I didn't know who they were. I had a suit from a small child that I wore to every funeral in Pike County. Mostly people, I had no idea who they were as I watched adults weep and cry for the dead. But I went to church, and it was real. It was true. I did all the right things. Studied my Bible, Bible drills. I was in the choir. I was in ensemble. I was in the church plays. I was in royal ambassadors where we learned about missionaries. I went on mission trips, went on youth retreats, discipleships. I did it all. And then I left and went to college. And I continued to go to church. I believe I've said that to you before, but it bears repeating. As the years passed in my college days, Church became the best place to find the good girls, and that became my motivation, (laughs) rather than seeking the Savior. I still believed, I still believed that there was a time coming, I even hoped in the salvation that I received as a nine-year-old. But I, I began to walk away, I began to forget what it meant to come to the Lord with a penitent heart, a repentant heart. I began to do things in my own power. I began to do things because of the ceremony, because it's what my parents always did. I praise the Lord. Raise up a child in the way that he should go, and he shall not soon depart from it. I have a deep theology about that, but at the surface level, the reality is that if we can train a child in the church, though they may be wayward, they may return, and probably will. And that is a hope that many of the parents in this room share. 
the Lord was gracious to me. The voice calling in the wilderness to repent and to be baptized with Holy Spirit and fire echoed through the generations in the voice of a young lady that saw in me more than I saw in myself. And because of a relationship that was grounded, because of a continuing understanding of who Christ was, when Anissa was brought into my life, together we returned to that reality. Now there has been conflict along the way. There have been opportunities to turn my head away from Jesus and to sink back into this raging sea. And so I ask the same of you this morning in your journey. Some of you in this room excite me with great passion. You are new in the faith, though you may be old in age. And your excitement for the faith reinvigorates me. Learning, discovering, wanting to know. Some of you, faith came several years ago. And you've moved and developed with the Lord. But then it became routine. And then some of us, like my story, grew up in the church. Walked along the path did all the right things. And somewhere along the way, as C.S. Lewis writes about the character Christian, we begin to think that we've arrived and we stop growing. We must, in our journey, what God is calling us to, we must repent of all of our sins. And as I brought to your mind in preparation for communion today, that is an ongoing reality. Would that it be that upon the day of our salvation we stopped sinning, but it is not the case for any that I have ever met. It is a daily reminder when the Lord gives us breath for a new day that we have failed in some way. The daily prayers of the Anglican Church and similarly of the Orthodox Church include that. Jesus Christ, mercy me, a sinner. Always and in everything. I do not deserve his blessing except that I come to him with a contrite, a penitent heart. But we also must be right-minded about our religion and are we. If we come to the point that we think we have arrived, that we know everything that there is to know, and we stop learning, then our journey will regress. We will, in fact, be set aside. I have testimony of that in my own life. The Lord will set you aside because you become a distraction to the plan. God has a plan for your life. God has a desire for you in obedience to work. And if we resist that plan, if we resist the fact that there are others that need him as desperately as we do, the Lord will complete his plan, but he may do it without us. What a blessing. Are we right-minded about our religion? And then more importantly, do we come to the reality of who Jesus is with humility? We will see in just a moment as we discuss this chapter that John the Baptist came with humility, ridiculed, the clothes that he wore were uncomfortable. They were representative of a prophet that was rejected. He was giving a baptism and a cry to repentance that was not the norm in the church, in the temple, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then more importantly, Jesus himself will come with humility. Jesus didn't need baptism. He approaches his cousin he is recognized finally as the Messiah. 
and in humility and in obedience in his fullness as a human, he is baptized by another man into repentance to bring forth the baptism of the Holy Spirit and of fire. As evidence of this, when Jesus comes out of the water, the clouds open. God, in his great excitement over this inauguration of the king, the king that has humbled himself to be a servant, announces, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus has now, in obedience, acted. And God says to all of us, Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus himself gives that example. So do you have peace in your heart or do you have turmoil? Ian, I've got a little feedback. Is there a reason why? It's turned again. <laughs> That's why. We figured that out during the week. I forgot about it. John the Baptist appears prominently at the beginning of the four Gospels. So one of the few characters that is in all is John the Baptist. In Matthew, in fact, he takes a place of prominence as the very first person to appear when the public ministry of Jesus is recounted. What an amazing story John has. The declaration that Jesus the Messiah has arrived. There's a near three-year gap, century, mm -mm, a near three-year decade gap between Matthew chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 1 and 2 that we will recount in the next few weeks as we tell the story of the Lord's coming culminates. And then nearly three decades later, Jesus arrives on the scene and is inaugurated as the king in the ministry of John the Baptist, who has been preparing for Jesus' public ministry by calling Israel to repentance and preparing the way of the Lord. <clears throat> this is your story. The Lord has declared preparation for the way of your salvation, and he called you to repentance. In your life's journey, whether that was in the church or outside of the church, whatever experiences it was, whether they were traumatic or of true blessing, God was preparing the way in your heart to receive the Lord. And then that day came that you were challenged by the Spirit first, perhaps by a person on earth, or perhaps in a circumstance in your life, to repent of your sins and declare Jesus as Lord. The proclamation of the kingdom can be easily misunderstood both then and now. Then... The proclamation of the coming kingdom was exciting to the Jews that were faithful to the temple. The Jews that were faithful, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, were looking for a literal king on earth to overthrow the Roman Empire, to reestablish Israel's place. And you and I, perhaps today, as we've grown up reading stories of night's tales, as we've watched um, the wedding of royals, if we've watched the progression of the passing of a queen here recent, recently, and we associate that idea of a kingdom, perhaps subconsciously, with Jesus. Jews at that time thought of this overthrow of Rome, and today we have nations, states, republics, but no kingdoms. Today, kingdom can make us think about ancient regimes. But for Jesus, the kingdom is not political or geographical. Boy, that is one that comes up over and over in our republic, isn't it? We want King Jesus to be our president. Would that it were so. But the reality is that is not the kind of kingdom that he is bringing. 
nor the kingdom that has already come. For Jesus, it's not political or geographical. When he says the kingdom has come, he refers to God's exercising his royal authority in a new way through his son's ministry. New on this earth at this point of his baptism, the restoration of all things, Jesus coming as the perfect example, and his reign might be visible on earth just as it is in heaven. Lord, teach us to pray, the disciples ask. And he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can say, therefore, that God's kingdom comes not when Israel regains her territory, but when God rules. We look with some excitement at the end times happenings. We try to predict with excitement this hope of the coming. I'm excited about red heifers too, not fully knowing why, but I am a little bit. I like seeing the menorah. All of those things are good and true, but when Jesus inaugurates his ministry, the kingdom is near because he's got the authority to rule. God reigns over everything. His rule becomes more visible when Jesus begins to teach, begins to heal, when Jesus restrains Satan and he calls the redeemed to himself, when men and women repent, believe, and walk in God's ways, they embrace his rule. Not to do a ritual or even to have an emotional experience, though it often is, and that emotion is real. But this repentance is to come into the kingdom. Not to cross over a border. Not to become part of the club. Not to be a joiner. Not to have a fulfillment of the fear of missing out. The FOMO of this generation. That there's something going on at that church and I want to be a part of it as part of the club. As part of the journey. But instead, it's to embrace God's rule in our life. If his kingdom has come in your life, if the kingdom that has come on this earth is real, the purpose is to embrace God's rule in our lives. John's call to repentance sounds similar to the prophets of the Old Testament. In fact, it is why he is compared quite often to one of the other prophets. That this relationship with God must affect every aspect of our lives. Repent, indicating to change one's mind. Repentance in the Old Testament is always called for a change in a person's attitude toward God, which would then impact one's actions and the direction of their life. We see it, don't we? We applaud it in people's lives. When we see especially the one that comes to Christ late in life, The one that we knew throughout their life as the rebellious child. The one that was the drunkard, the drug addict, the sexually promiscuous. And then the Holy Spirit through their prompting brings the rule of Christ into their life. We see a transformation. And it is evident. The same transformation is just as real in the young person that recognizes sin. But a young child cannot, in the fullness of their understanding, the limit of their understanding, understand the fullness of the depth of sin. They don't know yet all that they will face. And so that walk requires a careful attention, which we will talk about in just a moment, from those that have committed to disciple and to support. I give this challenge often when there's a text similar to this, but I would recall to your minds two situations that have been done since I've been here. One was two separate baptisms. The other was a child dedication. In each case, we, the church body, committed to disciple and to help raise that child. Do you remember their names? Do you even know who they are? The commitment that you made that day to help, to nurture, to guide, to lead, 
to be an example. Are you living up to that commitment? How much more so are we not in our humility to judge the one that got baptized, to judge the child who is dedicated to a life if we are not willing to engage in helping them walk in that life and return to a point of repentance. I love to see a child saved. I really do. And I love to see an adult saved. The difference is the child's, child's wonder and amazement can shine just as real in an adult. And I love to watch that. But somehow the stuff of life, the disappointment in the direction of life can attack a child if they are not guided, if they are not led. Repentance in the Old Testament always calls for a change in your attitude. External signs of repentance regularly included continual confession of sin. Our men's group is a beautiful example of that as we pray each week without prompting Broken men cry out to the Lord again of their sins, begging the Lord to forgive them, and then marveling at God's grace and mercy. Prayers of remorse, the things that I have done in my past. Time after time, there's prayers of remembrance of all that God has delivered us from. But then more importantly, an abandonment of that sin. Working in drug and alcohol rehab, we have a saying that relapse is a part of recovery. There is a reality, especially with drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine, LSD. They are insidious drugs. When you take and ingest into yourself something that is destructive to alter yourself, part of that is left behind. And in a time of struggle or depression or trauma or even just bumping your head, some of that remaining drug can be released. And a year later, two years, five years later, you feel that euphoria again because the drug has been released. We can look down our noses at drug addicts when that happens. We can be judgmental when one that seemed to have been doing so well relapses. But the reality is in our own lives as Christians, we do the same with all of our sins. Think back to that sin that you repented of that was most grievous in your heart that the Lord convicted you. Have you throughout your life and your growth not returned in times of desperation to wanting to do that thing again? To return to that thing that you hate so much. But the reality is that if we confess our sins and we pray in remorse, there should be in our lives an abandonment of that sin. Matthew chapter 3, 1 through 6 describes John's wilderness preaching. He proclaims that this kingdom is at hand, and Matthew connects his message with Isaiah's prophecy. John is preparing the way. So many receive baptism realizing that they're coming for repentance, baptism of repentance. They confess their sins, they're doing the right things. To repent is to prepare to join God's new work. The kingdom is at hand. The Messiah has come. But John encounters another group. And he doubts the sincerity of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he goes so far to call them vipers. They have come out to strike at John and those that have come to be baptized. To repent vipers. And he says that he will believe their repentance when he sees their fruit. We have to be careful in judging one another, but the reality is that if our salvation is true, then there will be fruit bearing. John makes that very clear as he prepares for Jesus' final and cleansing baptism of the Holy Spirit that will burn away everything like fire that doesn't belong there. 
he calls out these religious leaders. These people that have gone to church their whole lives, that have grown up in the religious practice, that have done the right thing. Dare I say the same people that today bear the name of Christian in America. We've checked the box. We've gotten our fire insurance. We do the ritualistic practices, but we forget the reality of what our salvation means. John calls them out. Their lineage will not deliver them from their judgment. They appeal to Abraham as their father, and he says, I don't care who your daddy is. This is all about you. They will soon fall as fruitless trees. They recognize this analogy. Finally, John will point to his successor. John's baptism is necessary. It's good. It's a reminder. He baptizes with water as a representation to wash away after repentance the sins that have been confessed. But the one that's coming is far greater and he will baptize with spirit and with fire. Do you still stand in awe and trembling at that reality? That the day of your salvation, that you declared the Lord publicly for the first time, that you were baptized, you are entering into an infilling and an empowering of the Holy Spirit. Did that terrify you? And in fact, you were submitting yourself to passing through the fire so that all that didn't look like Jesus would be burned away to be made into his image, conformed into his image, to look like Jesus. So first, there's a warning of judgment, but also an invitation to life and to change. The arrival of God's kingdom and the proclaiming of John the Baptist is a warning of judgment. And so far, I have been very strict to remind you of this warning of judgment. But just like John now, I want to invite you into a life and an experience of real change. Within the kingdom is life. Outside of the kingdom is death. The invitation today to repentance is not because God hates you, I hate you, John had an agenda. It's the reality that the kingdom life is life. And anything other than that is death. Just like my God in heaven, it is my desire that none of you should perish. And I will work to call myself to repentance. I will work to come alongside you in love, calling you to repentance. And I declare that we should work together in calling others to repentance. Because kingdom life is so glorious. Secondly, we can get caught up in a snare of our spiritual pedigree. John is skeptical when he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism. Just this morning in our reading from Acts together, my wife and I were reminded it is the first stop, in fact, on our trip to Israel where John declares, would that you all could become like me, except for the chains. Paul could have declared that he was a Roman citizen and been let go. In fact, Festus says that to him. I wish that he wouldn't have said that. Paul could have recanted everything in that moment and been set free and gone about to do what he wanted to do. Paul could have rejected. Paul could have appealed to being a child of Abraham. Paul could have appealed to being as he did in his righteousness like a Pharisee. 
each of us could appeal that we are good Christians and we go to church. But brothers and sisters, just because you live in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. Just because you come to church and call yourself a Christian doesn't make you one. Your repentance, your salvation is an individual choice, an individual journey, and it happens day by day. Israel's leaders often had been hostile to prophets like Elijah and Elisha and Jeremiah. Later, the Pharisees and Sadducees will continue to find fault with John. This one that inaugurates the king of king into kings into his mission. They will find fault, they will condemn, and they will ultimately see him executed. His head taken from his body and presented as a trophy at a party. So it is probable that they have come in suspicion to investigate John. John, knowing this, warns them first by calling them vipers and asking who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Second, if you do come sincerely, then you must bear fruit. A changing of your heart and your hands that the foreshadowing of that concept will be they will have the blood of his death on their hands. And then third, John anticipates their objection. No one avoids God's judgment because of his ancestry. You've heard it said in this very county. You've heard it said in this very sanctuary. My mama went to that church. My grandmama was the fundraiser for that building. My granddaddy put the paneling on the walls. whoop de doo Thank you, brother. whoop de doo Where is your heart? What are you letting the Lord do in you? Where is the evidence of the fruit of your salvation being born on the tree that you were grafted Gentiles into? This root of Jesse that is inaugurated this day, this ironic statement that the Pharisees will be cut down to the root and thrown into the fire. The reality is when you and I declare Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, we are grafted in. We are not the root. We are not the tree ourselves. We become a part of the plant. And if there is life, which the kingdom brings life, then you will bear much fruit. Now, some of you may at this point be reflecting on your lives. I don't see a lot of fruit in my life. Do not despair. Where is your heart right now? Perhaps the Lord is taking you through a season of quiet. I've read that prayer to you before about being set aside for the Lord. Perhaps there is a time that we are to be reflecting and listening and confessing. Perhaps there is unconfessed sin in your heart. And that is why fruit is not bearing. I am not calling you to guilt, but perhaps remorse. I'm not calling you to some emotional transformation or change in your physical affect so that you put on a smiling face and play the part. I'm calling you to reflect and to examine your hearts and to recognize that you cannot count on your church attendance. It doesn't matter how many times your name is checked off in a book that you brought your Bible to Sunday school. There's a great old song that says, I've heard you're into the Word, but is the Word getting into you?
Here is where you can pray for your leadership, for your pastor, for your elders, for your board. Religious leaders are prone to becoming self-righteous. And we can have a moral display of hypocrisy and repentance, fourthly, is urgent. It is not the hour for the Jewish leaders to judge John. They should have come and humbly watched and listened. It is the hour for them to repent or to face God's judgment because the king, in the very next two verses, will be placed upon his earthly throne and inaugurated as the bringer of the spirit and of the fire. To be born into a Christian home is a tremendous privilege. A tremendous privilege to have Christian parents. I hope that the Lord gives you opportunity to encounter those that did not have that privilege. I hope that the Lord allows you to sit down over a meal or a cup of coffee or a car ride or a trip to talk to those that were raised in another religion, to hear from those who rejected Christ, but now who know who He is fully. This privilege of having Christian parents who attempt to live out a godly lifestyle and who try to guide their children into the direction that God has intended for us is a beautiful thing. And Christian parents are privileged to have the guidance of the Scripture and the Spirit to help raise our children the right way. Over and over and over again as a new child comes into this earth, into this life, the most common thing that I hear a new mother say, a new father say, is I wish there was an instruction book. I wish I had been told more clearly about the every two-hour feedings about how the lack of sleep will feel, about how to deal with the mountains of laundry and the dirty diapers. I wish I'd have known. I wish there was instruction. There is not an instruction book. One was attempted to be written in the 60s, and it has damaged the way that we parent, and it should be thrown away by Dr. Spock. However, The instruction book that you are given as a parent is not how to change a dirty diaper. It is not how to feed at 2 o'clock in the morning. It is an instruction book on how to depend upon the instructor. We don't need an instruction book. We need an instructor, a paraclete, the Greek says, that comes alongside that guides us. And it is this instructor, this paraclete, that comes alongside that Jesus ushers in. When you are baptized into Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. And it is that Spirit that guides us. But Christian parents and children alike need to remember there's no guarantees. The privilege of a Christian home must be accompanied by accountability. Brothers and sisters, I confess before you today That in trying to hold my children accountable, I did it the wrong way. I have had to confess and I have had to correct a mistake that I made in my son Gavin's life when he was 14. I was trying desperately to teach my son accountability. And in my methods that were not Holy Spirit guided, I crushed his heart instead. Parents, it is a heavy burden in how we guide our precious children. It is not something to fear, but it is something that leads to our third point. In all that we do, we must come at it with humility. We must take God's calling on our lives with deadly seriousness. That there are teachers out there that are teaching a wrong way. 
that there are colleges and schools that are teaching horrible, horrible things are a reality, and they have always been a reality. It is deadly serious that we daily should examine ourselves and that we should guide our children if the Lord chooses to bless us by putting them in our care. But we must not get caught up with appearances. One of the greatest statements that you can give to a child is, I don't know, but I'll try to find out. I don't know, let's look it up together. It is so easy for us in our bravado, in our fear of being wrong as parents, to give an answer that is not complete, that is not true, that is a wives' tale, and to not seek the truth. But it is the same difficulty with us as Christians day by day. When we are discipling one another and we don't know the answer, to say, I don't know, but let's pray. Let's seek God's wisdom. Let's search the scriptures. Let's go find an elder. Let's go talk. Let us see and seek and find and grow in humility. And that's a tricky one. Because as we grow in our knowledge, as we grow in our understanding, as we grow in wisdom, we will encounter again opportunities to teach to someone else a thing that we think we've learned a million times already. And we can become impatient. I've told you in a different context that that is an issue in my life that I've had to work on, am working on. If I know how to do a task, I would rather, like my daddy demonstrated to me, just do it. But when someone comes to me asking me if I know how, I often miss the cue that they're not asking me to do it. They're asking me to teach it. Recently, a young man made a very brave phone call to a man in our church. He had had his first success with killing a deer. And that young man, in his humility but his desire to learn, called an elder in this church and said, Would you teach me how to process my deer? That is the humility that we should all have. I am wrestling with the scriptures I prepare for my Sunday school class. I've read this in a devotional. I've watched a movie and it confuses me. Brother, sister, elder, pastor, teach me. Spirit, teach me. Help me to learn because I don't know. John not only had a large following, he demonstrated authority as he rebuked the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. But he didn't get away, carried away with his own importance. You ever stop to think about that? We know who John the Baptist is. We love the story of him leaping in the womb. We tell that with great excitement as we talk about defending life before birth. We tell with great excitement the story of Jesus' baptism and John the Baptist is there in the miraculous time. Of all the people in the Bible, John could have easily said, look at me, I baptized Jesus. Jesus humbled himself to come to me for baptism. But he didn't do it. He understood clearly that his role and knew that there was one coming after who would be greater. They would have a greater role. John did not balk at being surpassed. Jesus was the greater one, the Messiah, the divine Son of God, who was ready to assume his momentous, his big redemptive role. And so did Jesus. Jesus assumed a position of subservience as he submitted to the waters of baptism by John. 
We will read in the next few verses that exact thing. It must be so for now. I have come to demonstrate through the baptism of repentance. And Jesus had nothing to repent for. But he submitted to the authority, to the necessity, to the reason. He did not balk at, seeing, at appearing lesser. This is a tremendous lesson for us understanding how we carry out God's calling in our lives. Neither John nor Jesus got carried away with appearances. They demonstrated strength in carrying out their roles in the plan of salvation, yet that strength has also included diminishing the appearance of their own importance. The key word is humility, a word that we don't do very well today. We hear a whole lot more in our culture and, God forbid, in our churches about our rights. Examine your hearts. We deserve nothing. It is a privilege to be a parent. It is a privilege to come into a marriage relationship. It is a privilege that we can assemble today, unafraid of someone bursting through the doors and carting us off to jail. It is a privilege, not a right. Did you walk through those doors today with that humility in your heart? If you did not join me in confessing that before the Lord. Every week I join with men in my office to pray and to confess in preparation to come to this holy place to speak God's word to God's people. And on the way, I have to battle my rights, the conflicts, the issues. And I have to humble myself before God that I've been given the privilege to declare his word. You have the privilege to join together with brothers and sisters that are hurting. You have the privilege to reach out to the widows and the orphans. God will take care of them without you, but he gives you the privilege. Do you humble yourselves in your individual ministries? That is not the most important, but it is one of the works that we do. We do not like to give up our appearance of importance. That has been a hard journey for me. I will confess to you that the Facebook Live platform is a struggle for me. I love the fact that Miss Kathy, who is here with us today, in her illness can sit at home and be part of the church family to an extent. But it is terrifying to me that there is a permanent record out there on the internet of my confessions, of my challenges, of the words that God spoke to me to present to you. And I will live in a fishbowl the rest of my life. All those things could be called up in an instant. I would encourage you, if you go now in a little while to Google me, that you just put Barry Hoot Busby and you'll get all the good stories. But the reality is that each of us have a story the day that we declared we were Christians. 
And if we go out there in self-importance that we are anything other than a beggar, pointing other beggars where to find bread, then we have lost our position of humility that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took just like us. John and Jesus give up a powerful, give us a powerful example of humility. The one that can make us most uncomfortable here, of course, is Jesus. And I want you to think about this. If you truly believe that Jesus was fully man and fully God, this is a fair question for you to wrestle with. If he is fully God and fully man, did Jesus wrestle with the mundane things of self-image? Brothers and sisters, I think we have a beautiful example of that. His first day of ministry would be a day that any preacher called of the Lord would be excited for. He preached a very short sermon. And then he went to a potluck. And crowds gathered around him to hear this message. People worked hard to get the sick and the lame and the blind before him so he could heal them, and he did. And the revival went on for hours. And it was good. But then Jesus, fully human, not wanting because he knew it was not his time to be on full display to the world, snuck out of the crowd. And went to be where? Alone with the Father. The disciples who missed the point came looking for him, didn't they? Hey, preacher, we need you to be at this event. We've got a thing every day planned for you. And we need you to be there to say the blessing. We need you to come be the speaker. We need you to come do the thing that you do. We've got an advertising plan. We're going to put your book out on the front table. We're going to sell it and we're going to give all the proceeds to charity because that will make us look humble. But Jesus said, let's move on. Jesus humbled himself in that moment and he said, no, my time hadn't come. It's not time yet. We're moving on. We're going, to, we're going to go to the next small venue and we're going to talk one-on-one and we're going to talk in small groups to people and we're going to follow the will of the one that sent me here in humility. Did he wrestle with his role? Yes, he did. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. How many of you in here by show of hands? I would love, this is a vote. How many of you have had a point where God has called you to do something that was hard and you hated conflict? You didn't want to do it. And you prayed that prayer with Jesus, if it be your will, take this cup from me. How many of you have been in that position? And then without raising your hands in that moment, did you say, not my will, but thine be done, O Lord. This Jesus, fully human, fully God, is our example of humility. That is a key element for his entrance into, into history. He not only accomplished salvation, but he also gave us the model of what a real human life lived in the power of the Spirit would look like. And this does not in any way diminish his deity. Instead, something beautiful comes from his example. It gives us a beginning glimpse of what his incarnation entailed. His advent, his appearing, his first coming. He laid aside both glory and the independent exercise of his deity 
He set aside for a time being God. To live a life like us. And that is why he is a very real and very tangible example of what our lives will be like when we are transformed into his image. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Brothers and sisters, it's uncomfortable to be with such a Savior. We would much rather focus on his great strengths. We love the story of the triumphal entry. We look forward to the trumpet blast. And so we shall see all these things. But his strength comes from his humble dependence on the same spirit than you and I depend on. So how do we respond today? I have three calls to us as we look forward to our response. A call to repentance. Today, what are the sins? What are the sins? What are the marks that you missed? Where have you failed? Today, confess them to the Lord with a contrite and humble heart. Do it secondly with sincerity. Your salvation, yours alone. From the Savior of the world. Not your mamas, not your grandmamas, not your granddaddies, not your aunt, not your uncles, not your friends. Your salvation requires you to come with the sincerity that you need it and then to walk humbly with your God. And then faith, that he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. On this day, can you be cleansed? A disciple repents by turning from sin to Christ And pursuing a new way of life. And full repentance can be elusive. We go back to that day of our salvation. It's hard to repudiate all of our transgressions. If we came to Christ as a small child, we had no idea that we would be placed in the places we would in our lives. Even as a grown person coming to Christ, we had no idea of the old man on the cross that we crucified at the day of our salvation that would call out, calling us back to our old life. Full repentance entails a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of practice. The repentance turned to God in faith and obedience. It may include sorrow that we have hurt somebody. and That is okay. But it is possible to sin against someone without hurting them. Jesus says in his discourse about, You have heard it said, do not kill. But I say to you that if you hate your brother, you have committed murder in your heart. The person that you hate is not dead. In fact, they probably are unaware. And you have hurt no one, but yet you have still sinned, Jesus says. If you lust... After a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. You have not raped her. You have not had her out of of marriage. You have not taken another man's wife. But yet the sin is still real. We can sin and not hurt others. We may harbor evil thoughts against them. But we can also inflict pain on others without sinning against them. It's not always about hurt of someone else. Dentists, physicians, physical therapists, chiropractors hurt people daily, right? And they don't sin. Repentance is also more than sorrow over self-inflicted wounds. If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. What is that besetting sin that cries out to you from the cross? There is no reason to revisit that. 
If Christ's blood is real, if the sacrifice is true, that sin has been taken as far as the east is from the rest. And so you can live not as a victim, but in victory. Your mess can become a message. That is the journey of wrestling with the reality of each other. That sins that I've committed that have led to destruction in my own life, so have you, sister, brother. And if I hide that in my anonymity, if I keep that to myself and I allow the enemy to remind me over and over and over again that that's who I am, instead of being a son of God, then he wins. But if my test can become a testimony, if I can wrestle with someone one-on-one in a small group in the scriptures with the Lord and be able to tell that story not as who I was, but who I am now, then to God's glory, repentance is more than just sorrow over its self-inflicted wounds. The truly repentant take their sin and guilt to God and find mercy and restoration. Self-condemnation and self-recrimination, listen closely, if you condemn yourself and you recriminate, if you bring a law and a judgment against yourself, that is a form of selfishness. Hold on to that one just a minute. A form of selfishness that will lead to death. The contrast, the opposite of that self-condemnation is a godly sorrow like Peter that led to forgiveness and restoration. Godless sorrow leads to regret and spiritual death. Peter and Judas are examples of this. For whatever his reasons, Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus knew it had to happen. And then remorse overwhelmed him in his remorse he took back the money he made it right financially but yet the remorse continued to overwhelm him he threw away this blood money and he grieved over his sin but he never took his grief to God or turned away from what he had done yes Judas did a terrible terrible thing. Judas Judas could have taken the money and returned it and declared to them, I was wrong and you should repent. I will stand this day with Jesus, but he didn't. He recognized his sin and he had remorse. Because he turned it inward. But Peter himself, did you lose me? You got two batteries back there, Ian? <laughs> Think about Judas for just a minute while I get to Peter's <laughs> By contrast, godly sorrow led Peter to forgiveness and restoration as an apostle of Jesus. Think about that. What is the real difference between Judas and Peter? Restoration. Repentance and restoration. Judas betrayed Jesus, but so did Peter when the chips were down. Judas was remorseful and tried to make it right, and so did Peter. He isolated himself for a time. Judas was led to death through his remorse, but Peter was led to life through his repentance. Brothers and sisters, confess your sins to one another, because it leads to life. True repentance includes openness to correction. If we're wrong, I hate being wrong. To be honest with you, I hate it. But I appreciate it. Because I love to learn. 
I love to know truth and the right. I want to know. Openness to correction and a, will- a willingness to admit guilt. I have shared with you my favorite saying from my dear friend and mentor. Confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. I don't like to confess, and I'm sure you don't either. It can make people think differently about you, but that's their problem. Confession that I was wrong corrects what is wrong. Confession restores. A willingness to admit guilt, a sense that God himself is offended, and a confidence that God removes sin's guilt through Christ. We can be inconsistent and act like Pharisees, boasting of our deeds, our status, or our heritage. And we can act smug and complacent. The call to repentance summons the church, corporately as a body and individually, to self-examine. That's what I've been begging for. Repentance is twofold. It rejects specific acts in the believer's life and requires a humble heart broken and contrite. A heart preparation. The repentant have faith. They love the king and his kingdom, so they yield to his rule. And only then can we have true peace. We lit the peace candle, the bringer of peace, the Lord of peace, King of peace. We can only find true peace in ourselves and in our lives if we humble ourselves and repent. Today, where are you? And you pre- as you prepare to give him room. As we think about the Christmas story, John the Baptist prepared him room. Will you prepare him room today? Whether you have been walking for years with Jesus Christ, there is still work to be done. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will you today repent and prepare him room? And if you are stuck in your trials and your conflicts, will you prepare him room through repentance, so that he can restore you to life. Will you come? sisters, it has indeed been a joy to be with you again this day in the Lord. I hope that you will return tonight as we continue in our study of the Old Testament. We will begin the book of Leviticus, see how far we get before the new year. Uh, Things are going to rapidly progress in December, aren't they? 
Lots of parties, lots of events, lots of things going on, and we're going to turn around and it's going to be 2023. Are you ready? I'm not. And, uh, but we will join together when that time comes, knowing that we are one day closer, one step closer to the return of our Lord, to that trumpet shout, to that great day. As we prepare to leave and go out into our duties for today, our time with our families, I hope, will be rich. Commune with one another, confess your sins to one another, wrestle with those things. Seth Baker, would you close us out?